All right, thank you everyone for being here. We're gonna go ahead and get started. I think um, all of our registered guests are here. We might have a few more people popping on. Uh, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Janet Geddes. I am the business owner and founder at Avid Bookshop in Athens, Georgia. Uh, we are really excited that you are here tonight and I'll tell you a little bit more about why I'm particularly excited. Uh, but I wanted to first uh, make note of the fact that we are living in very strange and difficult mm -hmm. times for so many of us. Um, but there are certain parts of um, the world that are not functioning as well as they need to be to keep our morale up. Um, that means that uh, musicians who had albums come out this year, uh, authors who had books come out during the pandemic, and restaurants and retail stores that really depend on seeing you face to face are not doing so great. Um, so I wanted to just remind you all, as you're already doing tonight, to support independent businesses, including bookstores like Avid, or if you're not in Athens, whatever your neighborhood bookstore is. Uh, we also have in conversation tonight, Patterson, who I will introduce more fully in a minute. Uh, he's the frontman for a band called Drive By Truckers, and they have a new album that came out this year called The Unraveling, which is tremendous. Uh, unfortunately, they had to cancel almost their entire tour. Uh, so they've been hit hard. So if you have some some money to send to a really cool album, you want to head over to their website and buy their new CD. And then, of course, the star of the evening is Julian Zelizer. His book came out this year, uh, again, in the middle of the pandemic. And a lot of the <laughs> authors who count on doing in-person author tours and a lot of publicity uh, have seen their book sales get damaged. And I know for me in particular, it's so important that someone like him is doing this work and examining American politics and doing the research. And in order to keep him able to work, um, I know that that is why I bought my copy of this book, which is called Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich, The Fall of a Speaker and the Rise of the New Republican Party by Julian Zelizer. Uh, before I introduce the author and Patterson, the in-conversation specialist, um, I want to let you guys know that we have automatically hidden all of your video. So there's a reason you're not showing up and that's so that we can have our speakers be front and center uh, and we muted everybody. So one uh, bit of housekeeping I'd like to show you, if you wanna just use your mouse to hover over the Zoom window, if you see um, above you something that says speaker view in the upper right-hand corner, leave it as it is. If it says gallery view, I want you to click on that word gallery view just once so that you're in speaker view. And once you do that, um, if you see any plain gray rectangles in front of you with different users' names on them, just hover to the upper right-hand corner of any of those gray boxes, click once on those three dots, and you'll see a drop-down menu that says hide uh, non-video participants. And if you hide that, then all you're gonna see for the next hour are Julian and Patterson, which is what we're here to see. And you won't see a bunch of gray boxes. All right, so I'm really happy you guys are here. That boring stuff's out of the way. So let me go ahead and introduce our featured guests. So Julian E. Zelizer has been among the pioneers in the revival of American political history. He is the Malcolm Stevenson Forbes Class of 1941 Professor of History and Public Affairs at Princeton University and a CNN political analyst and a regular guest on NPR's Here and Now. He is the author and editor, editor of 20 books, including The Fierce Urgency of Now, Lyndon Johnson, Congress, and the Battle for the Great Society, the winner of the D.B. Hardiman Prize for the best book on Congress, and Fault Lines, A History of the United States Since 1974, co-authored with Kevin Cruz. His new book, which we're featuring tonight, uh, is, of course, Burning Down the House. If you don't already have a copy, you can order one from us. There are links in the email you got tonight for the Zoom link. Uh, Zelizer has published over 1,000 op-eds, has received fellowships from the Brookings Institution, the Guggenheim Foundation, the Russell Sage Foundation, the New York Historical Society, and New America. He also is a co-host of a popular podcast called Politics and Polls. I bet there's a lot more to him, and that's just sort of the boiled down to the most salient facts about him. He's extremely accomplished, and we're really excited he's here. His in conversation partner is Patterson Hood. Patterson Hood is a prolific writer and performer whose character driven stories are packed with political subtext. He is best known as the frontman, singer, songwriter, and guitar player for the critically acclaimed rock and roll band Drive By Truckers, and is also a writer of essays, columns, and short stories. 
He's also a solar performer and producer. Uh, you'll want to follow him at DVTPH on Instagram, and you can see when he's doing live shows from this very attic room he's in today. Uh, he's an avid, avid customer and supporter. And in fact, when doing a little research on him tonight, um, I looked, I see that Avid Bookshop, our little tiny bookstore in Athens, boasts approximately 28,000 names in our customer database. And Patterson and his family uh, clock in at number 844. So he's in the, the very early adopters of the Avid Bookshop. So he practiced what he preaches. And we're really excited that he's doing this event with us. So I'm going to go ahead and hide my video and let these two uh, scholars take it away. Thanks so much for being here. Well, Janet. Thank you. Um, so we thought I could start, I'll, I'll read a little bit uh, from the introduction, just a snippet before Patterson uh, takes it away with, with some questions. I want to thank but Patterson for doing this. Uh, Avid Books, Janet, it's, it's really independent bookstores are the business you didn't mention explicitly, but for authors, they're at the heart of the creative and publishing process. So it's great to do this with you. And I'm only sorry we can't do this in Athens. Uh, live, but there's more books on the way, so uh, don't worry about it. And and I would also say before I start, uh, do get the last Drive by Truckers album. It was the last thing I think I did. Uh, they were in New York, uh, and I think we went to dinner, and then I went to see a show, and it's like an, another world uh, since that time. The unraveling actually happened, uh, not just the album, uh, but but our country, and a lot of the globe. Um, so. Uh, it's kind of uh, dramatic to reconnect now, uh, many months later, but, but I'm hoping uh, for, for better days. So I'll just read a quick little snippet from the introduction. The book starts when Newt Gingrich is being considered to be uh, Donald Trump's vice president. He's down to the final three. He does an interview on Fox News uh, with Sean Hannity the night he's interviewed for the position, and he's leaving the studio. And so I write, uh, not sure if he's going to get this job or not. And I write, after the interview ended and the crew removed his mic, Gingrich walked out of the studio. Whatever the next few days brought, he could feel as, the, as though he had won. Trump was thriving in the political world that Gingrich had created. Gingrich would always be Michelangelo to Trump's David. In Gingrich's world, Republicans practiced a ruthless style of partisanship that ignored conventional norms of Washington and continuously tested how far politicians could go, bending government institutions to suit their partisan purposes. Republicans went for the head wound, as Trump's advisor, Steve Bannon said, when Democrats were having pillow fights. The new GOP goal was not to negotiate or legislate, but to do everything necessary to maintain partisan power. If it was politically useful to engage in behavior that could destroy the possibility of governance which rendered bipartisanship impossible or would unfairly decimate their opponent's reputation, then so be it. Gingrich era Republicans were willing to enter into alliances of convenience with extremists to traffic in reactionary populism, nativism, and racial backlash. The party kept counting on Gingrich's media centered strategy, tailoring its actions and statements to push the national conversation in its favor even if that depended on mixing fact and fiction and practicing a new brass knuckles politics of smear. To be sure, this was not the first time in American history conditions on Capitol Hill bottomed out. Congress has been thorough, through a number of periods of vicious partisanship, such as the decades leading up to the Civil War, when relations disintegrated so badly that bloody altercations on the floor of the House and Senate were regular occurrences until the government totally broke down into dysfunction. While Gingrich era's, uh, Gingrich's era of partisanship did not witness outright physical violence between members, what did take root was the normalization of a no holds barred style of partisan warfare where the career of every politician was expendable and where it was fair game to shatter routine processes in pursuit of power, even when issues that weren't as monumental as slavery were on the table. In Gingrich's era, a crippling form of partisanship came to permanently define how elected officials dealt with almost every issue, ranging from who should lead the party to mundane budgeting matters to decisions over war and peace, and now I would add pandemics. So uh, that's a little, a little bit from the book. Man, 
Um, so what, what was your process towards like getting, deciding to write this particular book? I mean, uh, in relation to like your past several. Yeah, I mean, I started writing this book before Donald Trump was on the radar, other than being the apprentice star. Uh, so right. I wasn't really thinking about him. And I actually finished much of the book before he ran for the presidency. I put it aside for another book. Uh, I mean, one thing was to uh, write a history or a biography of someone who I think was pretty pivotal in creating the world we have today, which seems so hard to understand. Uh, to understand how did the Republican Party turn, make this really hard right turn and, and pretty uh, destructive turn. And I, I argue and believe Gingrich was central. So I wanted to write, write his story. And really, I wanted to understand how did the Republican leaders come to embrace him? So a lot of the books about the 80s, when he goes from being a, a bomb thrower in Congress, a maverick, to being part of the leadership on his way to, to being speaker. Uh, and, and that was really the heart of it. And then as politics progressed, it became more relevant. And as Trump became president, I mean, uh, it, it took on a whole, whole new meaning as Trump kind of put into practice things that Gingrich thought of, but to a whole new level. Right. Well, I mean, it, it, you know, of course, your, your last book was Frontlines, which, you know, basically told how 1974 was sort of a starting point for a cycle of events that has led us to where we are right now. And, you know, of course, I couldn't help but note that Gingrich first really, you know, shortly after that was basically when he started taking, you know, becoming an elected official and starting his run. That's exactly right. I mean, he was this PhD in history who was teaching in West Georgia College and he hated academia, too boring, too slow. And in 74 is the first year he runs unsuccessfully, but he runs against an old Southern Democrat, uh, John Flint, who's a kind of very conservative on race, uh, old school Democrat. Uh, but that is the year. And, and it's essential to Gingrich. I mean, Gingrich believed that the country had really come apart in the 70s and people were distrustful of leaders. And so he wanted to capitalize on that uh, for, for the GOP. So, so that is an important year kind of in both books. And that is where his launch starts. Right. You know, I, I couldn't help but notice certain parallels between he and Wallace, even though they were of a different era and a different time. And so it manifested itself in different ways. But, you know, Wallace basically saw an opening that he thought he could fit himself into, and then he personified the character that that opening called for. And I feel like Gingrich did very much the same thing just, you know, a, a decade and a half later. That's a great point. I mean, I think the two people in my head when I was writing about who is he like, one is Joe McCarthy, uh, and the second is Wallace. And, and Wallace, that is a good comparison. He was someone, Gingrich, he still is, who he sees these windows, and he'll make himself to fit through that window. Uh, he's not someone with a lot of core principle, uh, but he's someone who likes to exploit any path to power. He is a conservative. But you know, this guy started as a moderate Republican in college and, and graduate school, and he only moves hard right as he sees that's the way to win. Uh, and he's remained that kind of person uh, ever, ever since, but he'll do almost anything in that pursuit of power. And McCarthy, he's like in that he understands you could just say all kinds of stuff and the media will report on it. They'll eat it up. The more controversial you are, the more they like it. And he practiced a very similar style where he just throw out accusations of people, let it get in the media, and then it was too late once it was retracted. The difference with him and McCarthy or Wallace is Wallace ends up, uh, he, he doesn't become president. McCarthy never becomes a congressional leader. Gingrich becomes Speaker of the House. So that's the most remarkable part of, of their different trajectories. Sure, and, it, and as the trajectory has continued to evolve, now we've got soup. We've got cans of soup, you know, I mean, I mean, there's a straight line between McCarthy and Wallace and Gingrich 
and cans of soup. <laughs> you know? Yes, and it's. Imp- I mean, a lot of people are thinking of that now. There, I mean, there was a there was a moment, uh, even in the last 10, 15 years, where a lot of people still talked about the Republican Party as the party of Ronald Reagan and uh, this grand conservative coalition that, in general, was about tax policy and uh, just a, a more rightward politics. But now there's people. I'm one of them who say, well, maybe there's a road that led to the Republican Party that's in power now, and and it's been put too much on the margins, but in fact, it was central. And uh, that the McCarthy to, to Gingrich, obviously Wallace was a Democrat, um, but, but you know, he's, he's part of the shift that's happening to the Tea Party to Trump, but this is, this is as essential to the party as anything else, uh, this style of politics. And I think people are kind of waking up to that. Well, it's worth noting too that the the Wallaces of later years aren't they? They all defected from the you know the so-called the Southern Democrats, which was the you know the the more racially insensitive branch of the Democratic Party. They basically all fled, you know, beginning with the Civil Rights Act when Johnson signed that. You know, and then the Southern strategy, Nixon's st- Southern strategy, and then of course the Reagan era. You know, they all fled to the Republican Party. No, that's the heart of the uh, of the Southern strategy was to capitalize on the backlash to civil rights, both in the South but also in the North. Uh, sure. to, uh, pick up on kind of ethnic white workers uh, or voters who were very um, uh, who were very much opposed uh, to issues like fair housing and to bring them into the coalition. And, and some Republicans have been more honest than others that this is what it was about. Uh, Lee Atwater, who was one of the, he's in my book, and he was one of the key figures in this strategy. Atwater? Lee Atwater. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, after, uh, toward the end of his life, uh, when he's, he, he has cancer and he's, he's uh, basically on his deathbed, he basically has an interview with life where he admits this is what the party did. Uh, yeah. And there's a new book by a guy named Stuart Stevens, who is a big Republican operative. He ran Mitt Romney's campaign, and it's called It's All a Lie. And he basically says, I couldn't admit it, but this is what we were doing all along. So that is where the Southern Democrats, or that part of the Southern Democratic Party went. They went to the GOP. And Gingrich is one of the first people who's in that shift. Right. Right. You know, it's it's funny because tying back to 74, 74 was the year of Wallace's big pivot because he had, uh, I mean, I guess to some extent, the term that he was completing in 74, I guess, was sort of part of that. But all of a sudden, there were black voters. And so he pivoted his entire message in order to appeal to as many of them as possible, which culminated with him winning, you know, over 90% of the black vote in Alabama in 1982. So, but 74 was the big pivot year when he ran his campaign as this sort of centrist. Yeah, I mean, Gingrich, initially he presented himself that way. I mean, he was very much early saying, I want to bring African American voters into the Republican Party. If, if even to this day, if you say that he plays on race, nothing gets him angrier than that, and he'll give you. Uh, examples of why this isn't the case. But, you know, his career is littered with using code words and kind of embracing the rhetoric that tapped just into that sort of anxiety. I, I don't know how deeply held the feelings are, but but he was certainly part of the party that, you know, capitalized on this anger. I, I find that more insidious. I mean, I, I honestly, I prefer my racist assholes out in the open so that you just know where you stand and i don't know <laughs> yeah well i mean he he I, I hear you and i think that's uh that's an important story of the party and um you know this guy though gingrich is is so ruthless as a partisan that he will do whatever is necessary to win he, he argues basically in his whole career partisanship comes first whatever is going to get republicans party uh, power you do Uh, And that opens the door to the sort of politics you're talking about. At other points, it's less important to him. Um, But it's a mentality that's pretty corrosive. Um, And and you don't always know what it's about, like you're saying, even if it's underneath the surface. 
you know, you, you talk about how initially the Republican Party was sort of not eager to embrace what Gingrich was bringing to the table in his early, you know, when he first got there and, uh, and how that had kind of evolved. Would you like to touch on that for a second? Yeah, I mean, that story is like what you see today. Uh, and you had older Republicans in the 1980s. Gingrich comes to Washington, he wins in 78. He runs this really nasty campaign against the Democrat. Uh, her name was Virginia Shepard. And it's, it's really below the belt politics. And he comes to Washington. And like within a year, he's doing things that most members of Congress think this is toxic stuff. You can't really do this. Just laying out accusations about people, smearing their reputation, doing things that are going to be destructive. And there are senior Republicans, like there's a guy named Bob Michael. He's the House Minority Leader. And he's an old school Democrat, a Republican from Illinois. He has friends with the Democratic Party. He believes you have to get along so that the institution works. And initially, those kinds of Republicans wanted to keep, you know, arm's length with Gingrich. And they didn't think this is the guy who's going to be our future. But the story of my book is within a few years, a lot of them are slowly saying, OK, well, we'll work with him. We'll, we'll bring him into the halls of power because he's useful to us. And they kind of believe they could contain him in the end, that they'll have him as part of the party. And uh, in the end, he won't be the whole party. And I my book of Lindsey Graham a little bit in 2016, you know, talk, you know, distancing, trying to distance the Republican Party from Donald Trump. And of course, you know, now it's just an open, loving embrace. No, it, it's very much the same. Even uh, George H.W. Bush, who runs, he's vice president, he runs for president in 1988. And he's the ultimate embodiment of old school, very civil Republican. But when he runs for president, he uses a lot of the stuff Gingrich is talking about. Well, Lee Atwater. Lee Atwater. Yeah. And he runs a kind of vicious campaign. And that's yet another example where they're constantly making the compromises. And you see that uh, through today. The difference is now, I mean, Gingrich gets into power. Now that part of the party is the establishment. So. Uh, anyone opposing them really isn't, uh, doesn't have much say anymore. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and it, it all ties, of course, you know, my, uh, my partner, Mike Cooley in the band, he has a song about Lee Atwater, uh, right. our song made up English oceans is all about Lee, At Lee Atwater. And he's, uh, uh, Cooley's like studied him in depth <laughs> in, in researching, writing that song. But um, it's uh, uh, yeah. Well, I remember speaking to him once, and he had read the last book, and he had very much. I we had a little on Lee Atwater there, and he mastered everything that was in there. Um, and Lee Atwater is an important figure. I mean, he is. He's kind of a kindred spirit to Gingrich. This was the new generation of no guardrails Republican politics, and. Uh, Outwater did what Gingrich did in campaigns. He said, you say whatever you need to say, you do whatever you need to do, and you cut the other party down. That's the only way to win. And that's what Gingrich was doing. And the two have a very good working relationship uh, in, the, in the story of my book. So uh, I remember Cooley likes, uh, uh, or is fascinated by Outwater, doesn't like Outwater. Right. Uh, and, and there's good reason. And I was saying earlier to you, before this, your song, uh, The Part of Him, which is about the Tea Party. Uh, right. And it also very much reflects that, that this is, it's not about the principle. Uh, it's about these are the figures you want now as the face of the party. They'll be replaced when no longer useful, as Gingrich will be. Yeah, well, as the Tea Party was. I mean, yeah. I mean, it was, you know, in, in writing that song, I was, it definitely all harkened back towards, you know, the Lee Atwater era and what that wrought, you know, this era, this idea of the replaceable person on the totem that just represents, you know, our, our worst, you know, our, our, our lesser angels. <laughs> right. But, um, um, and Nixonian, I mean, you have, and that's important right. too. I mean, you have a line in this totally Nixonian uh, and I think that's the other way 74 looms large. I mean, uh, here was a, a party that, that kind of 
saw what Nixon had done and they were determined somehow to rebuild the Republican Party after that, but they end up embracing his worst elements in some ways uh, mm -hmm. in terms of how, how do you pursue politics. And you, you know, Nixon, Nixon was much more contained than Gingrich than Trump. Nixon still believed he had to do things in secret at least. Or he couldn't just do it. And what you've seen is a shift where that's no longer how they think about these issues. The party's moved in a much more extreme direction. Yeah, it, it, it makes me think, and I think it's worth touching on for the conversation's sake, where that leaves those of us on the left, you know? And I, I, I'm really disgusted by that whole form of politics, the whole Newt Gingrich. I, I hate the thought of having to have our own Newt Gingrich in order for us to win. And yet it seems like the the shift of the national conscious does seem like it's heading more in that direction to the point to where you almost just like I guess Clinton was kind of, you know, the Democrat who figured out how to win in the 90s. It's almost like the Democrat that's going to have to win next, it kind of scares me thinking what that's going to be and what that could potentially do to the ideals of our party for, for what's left of them. No, you that's know. a perpetual, I mean, problem. And, and the, so the book, it, it revolves around Gingrich taking down the Speaker of the House, this guy, Jim Wright, in 1989. And it's important because that's, Gingrich does this, seen as a big deal. No Speaker had ever resigned. And Gingrich is the guy who's really responsible. So this is why Republicans say Gingrich can deliver. But part of my story is Democrats wouldn't kind of deliver the same kind of punch back to Gingrich. They were very reluctant to do that. Uh, the Democrats who said, we have to fight him harder than he's fighting us. This is a guy with tons of ethical problems, a personal life that was a total mess. And, and why are we not saying that? They lost out. And I right. think in general, Democrats as a whole, they've never been ready to go to where the Republicans are. Ultimately, they believe in government. I mean, right. that is the burden of being on the left or even being a mainstream Democrat. And if you believe in government, you can't go to total extremes because you destroy the ability of government to work. Right. Republicans are fine with that because they're an anti-government uh, party. Uh, at least in principle. And so that creates this imbalance, but it, it leaves people, liberals, progressives, always thinking that exact question. They're thinking it right now as Biden faces off against Trump and Trump's starting to unleash the, you know, all his toxic stuff. What do you do? Do you fight back the same way? Uh, or do you still have to uphold some kind of decency or framework in politics? And for someone like Biden, I'm not sure if fighting back the same way it would even be an option. I don't know if he's capable of that. I mean, I don't think that's how he's wired. He's, you know, he is old school. He's old, you know, well, and Trump, you know, he's not much older than Trump in physical years, but he's much older as far as in his the school he's from politically, because he's been in politics all these years. Trump he was never really admittedly in politics until he ran for president. You know, he was, he was, had made himself a political, a political figure because it bettered his brand and gave him deeper reaches and access to more money. But I don't think he was ever particularly politically engaged other than just to start shit to, you know, promote his brand. I mean, I think that's right. And that this is why it's great to write history or interesting in that this is the same story I saw in the 80s. And I mean, back then you had the same situation where Jim Wright was a little like Joe Biden. He was speaker, not running for president, but he was old school. He, his whole mindset was you, at some level, you're committed to governing and you have to make sure the institutions of government work and you can't just lie all the time and you can't just call your opponent sick or a traitor and they're stuck in that mindset and it's it's impossible to move beyond that and i think you're seeing that play out right now i mean trump has no problem just saying outright disinformation and lies where it's much harder for biden to go to that same place even if he wanted to yeah 
He's not, he wouldn't be good at it. He wouldn't be good at it at all. It would come That's off. Not, yeah. He knows how to, I mean, he's already, he's already sort of has hands tied behind his back as it is because he is more than almost anyone in today's era. He's an old school baby kissing politician and no one wants their babies getting kissed right now. You know, I mean, so that's already putting him at a, a serious disadvantage because his entire way of, of, you know, of communicating with the public is based on being that, you know, hopefully not too creepy hug. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. And, and he's not, I mean, another point there that's important is he's not quite as good Biden in yeah. the modern media ecosystem. No. And this is the same, I mean, one of Gingrich's brilliant uh, elements, not good, but in terms of his political brilliance, he understood how cable television worked. And in the 80s, he was saying, you have to give cable conflict, you have to give them ongoing confrontation, because they'll eat it up. That's what well, they- Well, he turned C-SPAN into entertainment. C-SPAN, he turns into I entertainment. Mean, I mean, he played, he played the, it's like, let's make C-SPAN entertaining. You know, and so he would play C-SPAN as if it was, you know, and in turn, it made it a bigger entity. No, he did. He went, I mean, uh, I have a little part of the book that in 84, he goes on C-SPAN, which is a sleepy channel. No one watches it, even fewer than today. It's really not on the radar yet. And he and his fellow uh, kind of conservatives would go on at the end of every day, and they'd make these blistering speeches where they'd accuse... Democrats of being basically unpatriotic. They didn't support the war against communism. And they started to call out individual Democrats. And they would say, respond to the charge. What do you say about this? And if you're watching C-SPAN, the camera only focused on the speaker. So right. you, that was a rule, right? Totally empty. Yeah. And, but the media ate it up. All the networks covered this. They covered the whole scandal. Eventually, the speaker turns the cameras to show no one's there. But Gingrich, Tip O'Neill, was it? It was Tip O'Neill that Tony turned O'Neill. Cameras, right? He was called Cam Scam. <laughs> but what Gingrich says is he didn't care about any of that. What he liked was at the end he was the national story, and he said you have to give the media uh, more Indiana Jones than Philharmonic. Uh, that you can't. He said you can't get on television by driving a safe car, and I think that principle goes right through today. And you see the president do it in the Twitter world and all of that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you know, a decade ago, we had Obama, and Obama was able to win in that way that only someone who has that degree of charisma and just blatant intelligence can, you know, and it's just, I mean, you know, he was, he had all, he had movie star charisma, you yeah. know, to go with the brains to back it up. And uh, it was it was an all around, it was a it was a once in several generations package. And yeah, I think you're right. And, and you had the, I mean, you had the total that that for a Democrat to win, it seems yeah. like the big ticket because of the disadvantages of how we campaign versus how they campaign. No, it creates an imbalance and the two Democrats who broke it, one was Obama with all the attributes you just said, and a, a political team that was incredibly savvy in terms of the media, right. uh, like David Axelrod, and then Clinton, uh, who's a different kind of Democrat, but, but he did create a war room. I mean, he's the closest to thinking we have to respond to the Republicans in kind. Uh, and, uh, but he too is someone with immense intelligence, uh, and and charisma, but it's it's extraordinarily difficult. There's a there's a basic imbalance now in politics, I think, uh, and and the only thing that might save the Democrats is just total utter disaster from the administration leads enough voters to pick the other person, like not even knowing who he is almost. Uh, that's the real saving grace, but that's not a way to hang your hat uh, as a party for the long term. I think. No. No. You know. So, uh, what's your thoughts? What's your feelings about about November? Yeah, I don't. I mean, that's, are you that's willing to say it, or you not want to go there. Well, I don't. I don't know. I mean, 
two things thoughts one related to the book is i think it's not going to nothing's really going to change dramatically i mean one of the things i want to argue with this and, it, and it's not unlike your song is that this kind of politics is really cooked into the republican party right now that the uh, way to think of president trump is not as this person who took over the party and remade the party but he is a product of a republican party that went far to the right and embraced a radicalism in terms of its tactics since the 1980s. And, and this is the culmination. And that's why Republicans pretty much support him uh, regardless of what he does. So one prediction is I think the party, win or lose, is gonna look a lot like Trump maybe cleaned up uh, come 2021. Uh, I don't know. I mean, in terms of predictions, I see that uh, it's clear uh, Joe Biden is doing well in the polls. I don't think it's because of him. I think it's very much because of the frustration and anger. It's more like 1980 when a lot of people turned against Carter. Um, but I wouldn't count Trump out. I mean, the kind of look at, you know, you're, you're in Portland and um, his ability to redirect conversations within days because he will say anything is a pretty big obstacle for the Biden campaign to overcome. And I think the administration, I don't say this is a conspiracy theorist, it's, it's out to undermine the integrity of the election. It's cool. trying to do everything possible to make voting difficult. What did he say yesterday in North Carolina or about the North double Carolina? Huh? Right, after warning of voting fraud, he urged North Carolinians to vote twice, which is illegal on mail and in person and look i don't even know what to say as a historian when a president's saying this kind of stuff yeah uh you're you're you you sound more optimistic than me <laughs> you really do because yeah. i because i, I, I to be think? honest i think we're losing yeah why we're, is that i i think i think that I think that Trump has, I think when he declared himself the law and order can't, the law and order president, the law and order candidate, I think that's selling. I think, I think he found his hit record. He found that beat that everyone wants to dance to. Not everyone, obviously, but enough people to have the number one record. He, 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 he he's, you know, that's his whap. <laughs> it's, and and it, I think it's working. I mean, I live in, you know, supposedly the most liberal city in America. I don't know, you know, whatever. I mean, you know, our city's not as liberal as Athens, Georgia. I'll say that. Yeah. But uh, but it's, you know, we're, we're definitely Portlandia is, the, is, you know, what people think of. And it's definitely the book, the liberal boogeyman that Trump says as far as our liberalism. But um, the, the way that he's been able to Tell, to create the narrative about what's supposedly happening in my city and how different it is from what's happening in my city. I mean, I live here, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a mile as the bird flies from, from the federal building where all the protests have been. The protests are a one square city block. You know, you could, you could really open-mindedly say it's a three square block area with the vast majority of that in one block. And yeah. so, you know, people, they post all the pictures of the boarded up buildings because of the riots. The boarded up buildings are because of the pandemic because our city closed. We closed when we were supposed to, we were slow to reopen. A lot of buildings are boarded up. They're, you know, we're trying to do what we can as a city to, to help the business yeah. survive a lot of them aren't it's ugly but it's not the it's not the riots there 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 have been very few things that could be called a riot that's more than a block you know and yeah. but the word riot scares people you know it scares grandma and grandpa and grandma and grandpa still vote yeah no I, do, I don't disagree with go vote for the law and order guy even though he kind of creeps them out yeah i mean look the uh he does two things. I mean, one thing that he does, uh, which is also Gingrich-like, is he's a storyteller. Right. And, and, you know, Gingrich was a historian. He's a reality TV guy and a, a marketer. And I think what you, I watched the Republican convention and I said, my God, they pulled it off for the reasons right. you're saying. Not That's a horrific, horrific thing to be able to say, but you're right. 
No, they changed. Yeah. I mean, they they spun a whole narrative about kind of a, a riots and disorder and chaos. And even though he's the president, they blamed it on the Democrats. Yeah. And now the other thing he has they is blamed it on Obama. It's Obama's fault. It's he Obama's started fault. all this right. shit. Yeah, you know? as a conservative media, which is pretty powerful, you know, as an institution. And so it continues that storyline. And I think that Democrats should not ignore uh, the power of this. And it's in states like Wisconsin, too, which are going to be so critical. Um, I, I think they need a, a pretty strong response. But I don't disagree with you in terms if of the Democrats act like we're anything short of 10 points behind. We are setting ourselves up for a horrific next half a decade and probably a lot longer because it's going to take a long time to fix four more years of this i don't think i can take four more years of this i'm not sure i'll live through another administration this this is aging me you know just watching it unfold and the effect it's having on my family here yeah you know that's not even to get to the fact that if we get one more term you know the affordable care act is going to be gone because right. it's a miracle it's still there as it is you know and no one's even talking about that well and, i mean think know. this i mean think of any other president in history like a herbert hoover you have the a pandemic that not only ravaged you know human life but has caused closures and uh, industries to shut down. You have an economy that's teetering on collapse, uh, and yet it's a competitive election. Like, it's, it's an unbelievable statement to conclude that way. And that tells you a lot about why, you know, it's not a sure thing for Democrats at, at all. Um, there, there's no way this should be um, a competitive election. Yeah, but, but it, it is. is, that terrifies me. Yeah. It's a competitive election and there's, you know, a huge chance that there's going to be some very, you know, some cheating going on too. Well, yeah, no. And I think the, uh, you know, Republicans for decades have been pushing for voter restrictions uh, and that's why they have popped up in most red states at this point. Uh, and what you're seeing from President Trump when he goes after voting, when he talks about voter fraud or where he's attacking mail-in voting, uh, this is not new. This is part of the party. And, and that's why the Republicans in Congress stand right behind him on this. They are in no rush to increase voter turnout. And yeah. I don't know what things are going to look like in different parts of the country in a couple months. Uh, and people, even if in good conditions, might be worried about voting. It's like a health tax. It's the new poll tax. That you basically have to think if I don't mail it in, am I going to risk my health and life to vote? And it's outrageous that you have a system like that. Yeah. So, uh, what has to happen for things to change? That's a good question. I mean, I think, look, I think um, in terms of will the Republican Party change, I think it's going to take lots of defeats, meaning two, three, four cycles of elections to finally start to purge the Gingrich generation out of power and to allow uh, younger uh, people to change the party, not because they're altruistic, but because they see this strategy in the long term is, is not a winning strategy. I don't know if that's true, but I think that's what you'd have to see. Not only Trump losing, but midterms that then go badly, and then another presidential election that goes badly. You need a cycle. The only thing that's going to change the Republicans is uh, feeling that their party is going to lose power, because that's how they think. Uh, it's about power. But I don't know if that's going to happen. Then you need to reform. I mean, that's the boring stuff of politics. But the reform of the way politics works, you, you, you have to change, uh, you have to restore the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Like, if that is not done, we will live with this problem in, in a way that's, again, outrageous, given the blood that was lost in 65 to achieve voting rights. You need to change the way districts are drawn. So there's better uh, districts that are not gerrymandered to perpetuate this. You need money in politics reform so that issue groups like the NRA can't just flood legislators uh, with dollars. Uh, and, and so it's a combination of those two things for change. I mean, 
obviously not having Trump as president would matter. It's not insignificant. And that's the first step toward uh, change. But I think we're, we're still going to be a far, a far distance from where a lot of people want to go uh, until much deeper changes are instituted. And we have to deal with the ugliness in American life. I mean, you yeah. know. Well, we're not going to change the politics if we don't change the culture. Right. And, you know, the culture has undergone a lot of, well, I mean, I guess it's a, a danger of rapid change because we have undergone a lot of rapid change in the last decade and a half. And so there is the inevitable backlash to that, that, that comes from the people who feel shut out by the changes that we've made and, and are pushing back. And, you know, that's, I mean, that's a big part of the Trump appeal. No, yes, yes. Well, yeah. I mean, it, the appeal is people who feel left out. You're right. And then the question is, what do they feel left out of? Do they feel left out of the economy or do they feel left out of the society that's emerging that's more diverse and uh, where sexual norms are not the same? It's, it's probably both. But you have to deal with yeah. that. I mean, it, it's right in our face now. I mean, you're seeing kind of the elements of um, of, of violence and disarray in the cities. It's not the protesters, you know, that's the thing. It's, it's the supremacists who are coming into town uh, to, to stimulate this stuff. And, and it's really- We're losing that narrative. We're not getting that narrative out. You know, people, people still think that all the problems that have come along alongside the protest are part of the protest. And, you know, it's documented that that's not the case in a huge number of the instances. And yet that's not being told or not being listened to. It's certainly not being told on Fox News and it's not going to be, but I'm wondering if there's even a way to counter that. I think it's a lot like the way people talk about political parties, meaning People talk about partisanship as if both parties move far away from each other. And part of what I'm arguing in the book is one party really moves radical and the other is still pretty moderate and in the center. And I think law and order isn't that different, meaning people- Yeah, we're the ones being labeled as, right. as radicalizing. Right. You know, I don't feel very radical. I mean, I'm a, I'm an old white dude. I'm not very radical, you know? <laughs> you know, I play in a band. But, right. you know, our band's not that radical, you know, <laughs> it's just what, you know, and so. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, the idea that Black Lives Matter is a radical idea is is not the right way to think about it. That should be a just fundamental. And that's the point of the message. It's not a radical thing. It's you should have safety, whatever uh, the color of your skin. But the way in which the right has presented it, including the president, is this is a radical demand. It's a, it's a socialistic demand. It's leading to upheaval. And I think Democrats need to certainly get the other framing out, but they're, they, I don't know if they're, they've been very effective. Activists have, but the party right. hasn't. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm trying to make sure we have time before I go off any more tangents. You know, is, are there any, any ways you see us breaking the cycle? Well, I still take heart from activism. I mean, I, I always believe that in the end, uh, grassroots activism matters. And I do think people can make a difference. I mean, I do think the Black Lives Matter movement has been uh, effective at uh, putting the issue of policing and criminal justice front and center and raising <laughs> other kinds of questions from monuments to um, you know, the structure of different institutions. I, I think the, you know, the Parkland students, when, when they mobilized, they had a tough, tough fight because uh, they're fighting against the most entrenched interests. But, but I still think that kind of pulse in our democracy really matters. It always has. Uh, and I don't think every citizen is on board with a lot of the bad that's happening. And so, you know, in the end, my hope uh, doesn't come from Washington. It will come from from people who are willing to sacrifice themselves or you know, sacrifice their time and energy uh, to fight these fights. Uh, that, that's the biggest source of hope. Uh, but, but it's hard to have hope right now. I mean, you, know, you and I are speaking 
and people are listening on Zoom uh, because we are dealing with a policy problem that has been so catastrophically handled uh, that we can't open our institutions again, where in Europe, a lot of people are actually starting up again. Um, yeah. And so I think that's what checks it. But look, act, look, the civil rights movement of the 1960s did change the country. It, it didn't wipe out all the reactionary stuff we see today, but they did end uh, legal segregation. They did uh, get a Voting Rights Act. And, and I believe movements uh, have that power still. Right. Yeah, I hope we can prevent the criminalization of protest. Yes, especially when the Attorney General is talking about it that right. way. That's exactly the language that Barr used. And that's a danger. That's Nixonian. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, Democrats, they are Democrats in power and any Republican who dares to depart from the orthodoxy is going to have to stand up to that. That's a dangerous path. And it'll affect conservatives too. So it's a, it's a foolish way, I think, to treat activism. Right. I, I agree. Um, what else did we cover? What, what, what else we need to, to hit on before we run completely out of time? I've so enjoyed just getting to hang out with you and talk to you. Uh, I wish it was in person. I, I, yeah. I, I think, look, I think uh, one thing that's not as urgent as protesting and not as urgent as voting for sure, which I'd say everyone get that mail-in ballot if you can get it uh, and, and get yourself ready to vote. I do still value, you asked me earlier, like, why do I write a book like this? It's probably the same reason you write a lot of the songs you did, that it's important to have these conversations in areas that aren't Fox television or any network, CNN, MSNBC, and it's not just in the halls of Congress, that you need writers and you need artists to, you know, help people work through this. That's a, a long-term way to do it, but I do think it matters. It's an it's a important way to have these conversations so we can step out and, and think of a lot of the big, um, big issues. I mean, you have, look, I wrote this book. I didn't expect it to come out when it came out, which has been hard but it's also resonated in a way because of how bad things are. You had an album come out about a lot of the unraveling of this country and, and deep problems. And, and you definitely didn't want this to all happen, but it resonates even more powerfully now thinking about the song. So I think these kinds of conversations have to continue. The, the world of art and writing matters. Yeah, you know, I, I feel like writing is what keeps me kind of you know, on the rails as far as able to able to function and continue forward because it is it's the only way I'm really able to process the things that are bothering me is to find a way to write about them. And in, in the writing about it, I'm able to at least put it in a place where I can I can work through it, you know. And um so uh I'm 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 very grateful for your book. It's been it's it's been good company to have, and it's such a great book. And uh, and I've, I I look. What's next? What are you going to write next? So now I'm writing. That's a good question. Something totally different, and it's more on the inspiration front. I'm writing about a rabbi, a guy named Abraham Heschel, uh, who was a theologian, and he lived in New York. But in the '60s, when he was an older guy he got very involved in activism and all the work he did on theology and how do you be, how are you spiritual led him to take to the streets. And he became a pretty important civil rights activist. He marched, was marched with King and Selma, very close to civil rights leaders. And then he becomes a huge anti-war activist in the late sixties. And, and uh, uh, he founds this group of clergy against the war. Uh, that are at the forefront of the anti-war movement. So I'm writing a biography, which is almost done, about him. And uh, it's really, it, it's very different than writing about Newt Gingrich, but it's also <laughs> inspired by these issues we're talking about. How do you actually do something as a regular person to change the world? Right. Well, that sounds great. I can't wait. Thank you. I see, I see Janet's back. Uh, I've returned. Yeah, so before we close, so I loved that. Thank you. That was really enlightening. Um, I know that I and other loved ones uh, 
sometimes bury our heads in the sand a little bit because things feel really awful. So it was really enlightening and good to see two very smart people discuss this in a way that I could wrap my brain around. So thank you very much. And I'm sure our audience would be clapping if you could hear them. Um, you talked about uh, the importance of having conversations, the importance of activism, supporting the arts. And that reminded me of something I've been thinking of a lot since March, which is how I spend my time, energy, and money now sort of translates to votes for how I want the world to be after the pandemic. So I was wondering if each of you would just take a second to say something like, what's something that you are doing or you plan to do, whether it's a book you pre-order or an album you listen to, or an activist step you're gonna take? What's something that you plan on doing so that the world looks a little more close to what you want it to be after the pandemic ends? I mean, I'll start, I've been, I've been getting more involved with organizations, including a student organization that are focused on voting. And I just see this as the, one of the big issues of our time. It's under threat, it's the heart of our democratic process process and through my writing and through helping with these groups, um, I want to keep focusing on that. So not only can we make sure there's voting in November, but I, I really think we need to restore the Voting Rights Act of 65 and the protections that were put into place. So for, for me, that's my kind of political focus. That's awesome. I'm, uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm definitely urging people to vote and uh, I'm going to try to do some work for, for head count and, you know, to try to help on that end. Um, I'm trying to be outspoken and engaged as much as I can with, with, you know, with my community here and my community there and, and, you know, and, and whatever thing that, you know, we can do as a band or as artists to try to help move that forward. And, um, you know, and, trying to, you know, you know, money's tight right now with everything because, you know, we're out of work. <laughs> and so, but, but trying whenever possible to, you know, support that, you know, that little restaurant that's hanging on down the street that we love and we want to see survive or that bookstore, you know, and, and, you know, trying to do things like this and, um, uh, you know, the record store, you know, and uh, um, I've, got record stores that I love <laughs> I'm trying to do all I can to prop up. <laughs> yeah. but, so. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for sharing your time and talent with us. And just as a reminder to everybody on the call, uh, you can get the Drive By Truckers album, any of them, and merchandise at drivebytruckers.com. And then you can get Julian Zelizer's new book on Newt Gingrich that we discussed today at avidbookshop.com. So thank you so much. I think we have a uh, band camp sale Friday too. I think Ooh. there's a, like a, a one day only t-shirt that Wes Freed has designed with a, uh, uh, it's pretty awesome. It's like a posted stamp of a Wes Freed version of the Statue of Liberty and it says vote and uh, it's it's pretty it's pretty badass and uh, I think we're also putting up a uh, uh, two live shows from 2017. I believe it's the Thursday and the Saturday of Homecoming 2017, which was a pretty good one. We, yeah. we, we were revved up. That was a good one. And uh, so we're going to have those for sale on Bandcamp Friday and um, and of course, uh, you know, support your bookstores and record stores. Yeah, get your Julian books. Yes. Thank you so yes. much. I really appreciate it, you guys. Um, and we will be in touch. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Bye. Bye-bye.